Okay. Dr. Farley, where, uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in Rochester, New York, and I grew up in a suburb, Brockport, New York. Brockport, New York. And the Erie Canal runs by the town, which is why they have that port in the name. I see. Where are your parents from? Uh, my father's from Guyana, and my mother's from Jamaica. Oh, really? Where, what did your parents do for a living? My father was an economist. Uh, he worked for the United Nations for many years, uh, but then moved, of course, to Brockport, New York. Um, my mother is an historian, so for uh, many years, my mother was uh, chair of the Department of African and Afro-American Studies at the State University of New York College at Brockport. Actually, my father was the founding chairman of the economics department at the same college. So you grew up in, in academia? Yes, exactly. I grew I up in academia. I see. <clears throat> Did you spend a lot of time at the campus? I spent lots of time on the campus. I uh, remember exploring the tunnels in uh, the uh, physical education building. They're pretty cool. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in the library. And I still regard the, the library of the uh, SUNY Brockport, as they call it, uh, to be one of the best libraries I've encountered. And I've seen libraries like Widener Library at Harvard, or you know, they've got presumably 11 million volumes, but, uh, or the Bodleian Library at Oxford. But the library at SUNY Brockport was the best, and probably is the best. I can go there and I find books that are actually readable. I still borrow books from there. Um, and, uh, but I remember as a kid going through the uh, stacks and looking at math books and you know, books in other areas. Deductive Logic is one book that I remember borrowing when I was 10. I didn't understand it, but I liked it. So I think that's what led me into, indirectly many years later, lattice theory because of the, the um, motivation from logic. I'm assuming your father was mathematically inclined? Actually, the economics that my father did, as far as I could tell, didn't have much to do with mathematics. So I would say that the answer is no, but my father did teach me mathematics when I was young. Oh, okay. When you were young, did you excel at math when you first started school? Yeah, I was good at, at math. As actually, one of my friends, um, Mark Heiser, told me. So we were in first grade together, so I was probably five years old. And uh, then I saw him again. Uh, in fourth grade, I think it was, no, well, many years later. And uh, so he anticipated that, I mean, he, this is what he told me, I remember him saying it, that in first grade I was doing fourth grade math, and so he thought that I would still be three years ahead. But uh, I had dropped back to only two years ahead. I see. Was, was your mother good at math? Uh, my mother, let's see, she tells me stories from when she was a girl. She chose history for the following reason. Uh, she was a kind of a prodigy, mainly because her parents were school teachers. Her father was a school headmaster in Jamaica. And so she would hear the lessons of the older children. And so in the British system, you take all these exams at ridiculously young ages, like nine years, and nine years old, and that determines your future. Um, but my mother could take these exams that were meant for school leavers, people who were probably 15, 16 years old, when she was very young, like nine or something like that, and, and passed. And I assume to do well, she did well as well, um, in addition. And uh, so she was advanced for that reason. But uh, when she went to school herself, she had, was just learning the same facts over and over again in math class because math doesn't change that much at the school level. The only area where she was learning something new was history. So she was repeating the stuff that she had already learned years ago, but um, the history was different. And so that's why she, I think, lost interest in math or science and uh, at least was more interested, she became more interested in history. I see. I um I heard this thing that uh they compared um what is it how do you say this they had a a string they asked kids to memorize strings of numbers English speaking kids versus Chinese speaking kids okay and the Chinese speaking kids 
could memorize more numbers. Yeah, interesting. Than the English speaking kids. And they said it was a result of the Chinese language. Okay, that's interesting. Well, if you saw the movie The Arrival, uh, or is it Arrival? There's one yeah. movie with Charlie Sheen and one movie with Amy Adams, and they, they both have similar titles, and they're both about aliens. But if you saw the one with Amy Adams, they bring up the superior warf hypothesis from linguistics, which says that your the language you speak somehow affects the way you see the world. And uh, so there may be something to that, because uh, I often wondered, you know, in German they put the verb at the end of the sentence. And so if I were a better comedian, I could come up with a joke based on that where the meaning changes completely depending on the verb and maybe the person stutters. And so the, whoever's listening is trying to figure out what they're saying. Oh, and then it's the exact opposite of what they thought. Um, but uh, I haven't heard that study, but I can certainly believe something like that happens. But my feeling is that that's, that effect is probably drowned out by a bigger effect, namely that Chinese students probably have more discipline. I than, heard than the same students. thing. Yeah, they had the work ethic. Yeah, it's completely different. You don't want to shame your family here, yeah. especially uh, now in 2017. The uh, families almost let the kids decide what to do. Yeah. So I gave a talk um, two years ago for the Oxford University Society, some alumni organization for people in DC. They asked me to give a talk, so I talked about my work on math and counterterrorism. But uh, I have uh, a friend who is not affiliated with Morgan State University or Oxford, but she came and she brought her then nine-year-old son. Uh, but then I, uh, I offered to tutor her son, and she said she would ask him. And so, okay, I'm not a parent. That's her, obviously, parenting decision. But I personally would, would have thought that the parents would realize, oh, this is a great opportunity, so we're going to do it, regardless of what the son wants. Did your parents do that to you? Actually, they didn't. <laughs> but I also did what they said. So, um, so yeah, my parents never actually told me to do anything that I didn't want to do. It's just that I did everything that they wanted me to do. I see. So there is something to about the culture. Because uh, I never, like, I watch all these TV shows about um, rebellious kids, teens. It's almost expected that when a kid becomes a teenager, he's going to rebel or she's going to rebel. And that whole concept is totally alien to uh -huh. me. It's, it's bizarre. Yeah. To I, me. Uh, I don't want to say it's bizarre to me, but... We were just talking about Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, how middle school was... We noticed a lot of rebellion kids trying to be bad and stuff like that but um i guess i was trying to understand why you i i'm, a, I'm assuming you liked math when you were a kid yeah I, I did like math oh okay i also liked uh astrophysics i remember when i was maybe in second grade or third grade actually i think it was i would borrow a book from the local library and well there are a couple books i like borrowing from the local library uh, one was a book on, on white holes, not black holes, but white holes. And uh, in the, uh, uh, the R-rated version of your documentary, you can include the following joke. I had a friend, Chris Arnold, who didn't realize that this was a legitimate topic, so he thought it was something, you know, <laughs> for adults. <Wow. laughs> but, yeah. Any event. Uh, Talking about white holes? Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what that is. Uh, so they are presumably connected by wormholes to black holes. And so um, energy and, and light and I guess maybe matter spew out of them as opposed to oh, I've heard sucking of everything in. I see. And, uh, but there was another book that I, I liked borrowing which had a picture of the Milky Way galaxy on the, or had a picture of a spiral galaxy on the cover. And I thought it was the Milky Way. And I remember thinking, hmm, how do they get, how do they, get a photograph of the Milky Way, since we're in the Milky Way. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I, I remember borrowing these books and reading these books. So I was interested in astrophysics. So when I was very young, I actually wanted to be an astrophysicist. Um, when I was in middle school, I wanted to be a, I wanted to go into programming or I, I, the, the uh, vocation I had in mind was computer engineer, but then I became unsure if there was such a thing as a computer engineer. 
Uh, so it wasn't until high school that I finally settled on doing math. I see. And even then, when I settled on doing math uh, when I was 14, the idea was that because I did math, I could also do physics if I wanted to, or computer science if I wanted to. I see. I guess I'm trying to understand why some people at a young age um, cling to math. They like it a lot more than other people. And I was trying to say with the, the Chinese kid thing, the Chinese kids started off being able to recite more numbers quicker. Mm -hmm. And you couple that with the work ethic culture and all of a sudden they're better at math. They're pretty good at math and then that instills confidence and then they roll with it. And well, you should apply for a grant from the National Science Foundation. They actually fund social science, like psychology. And I actually often tell my students, even in the Math Field of Arts course, uh, that someone should do a study of various aspects of psychology related to mathematics, but this could be one of them. Uh, yeah, why are certain groups more drawn to math? Um, but, uh, so for example, um, you've heard of the alt-right now. Yes. And so there are lots of alt-right people who complain about diversity in commercials. They can't stand it. And so in the, in the movie, um, I think it was The Arrival Again with Amy Adams, they had uh, some uh, African-American physicists played, I believe, by Glover. Not Danny Glover, but there's another, another Donald Glover. Glover. Donald John Glover, yeah. John I always mix the two up. Probably he likes that because he maybe even changed his last name so everyone would, would be unsure whether he's related to Danny Glover and then he gets more parts in Hollywood. But and Donald Glover uh, plays this physicist, and then some of the all right people were complaining that this is ridiculous. But you know, it's not ridiculous because there's um, there are black yeah, there's Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's the, obviously the most prominent yeah astronomer. Period that Americans at least would know, maybe anyone around the world. Uh, or you know, we've been reading the news recently about Ben Carson, obviously not an ast astronomer, but uh, again a prominent scientist the best in this field regardless of uh, his ethnicity. Uh, so they're off the rails there. <laughs> what was the, what were they arguing, that it was they forced? They were complaining that it was forced and that you don't see any such people. And by contrast, if you really want to see a brilliant scientist, they would look like, and then they showed a picture of Terence Tao. Oh. And I said, that's the person that they would actually show. Like they, This literally happened. The show is called um, uh, it's Rebel Media with Gavin McInnes, uh, so <laughs> it's pretty funny. I wonder if any of those people have ever spent time in NASA. They ha have not, I'm yeah, sure. That so. They themselves are probably more oriented towards social science if they're oriented towards anything academic at all. And so they don't really know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget what I was going to say. I, uh, when you were talking about going into computer engineering and astrophysics, but then settling on math, I studied mechanical engineering oh, as okay. an undergrad, mm -hmm. and then I worked at UPS as a plant engineer. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. And uh, for six months, and then I quit because I hated it. Yeah, I didn't. I had never known what it was like to work as an engineer. Mm -hmm. I just knew they got paid a lot. Yeah. that's what I heard. Yes. and. It and was, they seem to. The yeah, the the coursework for engineering is like math intensive, but mm -hmm. once you're an engineer, there's no more math. Oh really? Okay, no. that's surprising. I noticed that most engineering jobs are there's some kind of mechanical system in place, mm -hmm. and you're there to maintain it. Okay. So you do inspections and maintenance work, and mm -hmm. you dispatch mechanics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it didn't feel like I was using anything math related and I thought it was boring. Mm -hmm. I see, interesting. So so when I entered college I restricted myself to um, science or math related stuff mm -hmm. and then I picked engineering but I now when I think back I like physics and chemistry and bio but I wouldn't want to do that stuff because of, there's a lot of stuff like lab work. Yeah, I hate lab work. That's very tedious. Yes, I don't like it though. <laughs> and then it took a while for me to realize I just like math. Mm -hmm. I just okay. like 
writing in my notebook and mm-hmm. thinking to myself. I don't know if you felt the same way. Well, I, start, I took several physics classes when I was in college, but I didn't like the math. And actually, I wasn't very good at physics. I can remember the derivations of formulas because that's sort of like remembering a mathematical proof. But when given a physics problem dealing with angular momentum, you know, my head was spinning. But I had roommates who were very good at physics, and they, uh, but they were real theorists. 